Oh, can we just give it up for moms right now? Man. Oh, I love it. I love it. I, uh, I said happy Mother's Day. The first four moms here that I said happy Mother's Day to, they looked at me and said, happy Mother's Day back. So apparently, <laughs> it's just a holiday for everybody, or moms were really tired uh, this morning. Hey, real quick before I get started, uh, just a really fun, exciting uh, news announcement for our church. Uh, Pause Coffee Lab is officially open. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> that has been like five years in the making. And so um, we, from day one, we wanted that set apart as a connection place for mission and community. And so on your way out, feel free to get a bouquet of lattes for your mom and uh, something wonderful. So uh, Mother's Day, it's just such a joy. And uh, there's this thing called Mother's Day texts where uh, text messages from kids to their moms uh, increase by 300% on Mother's Day. How how many of you guys received a text or sent a text uh, this morning? Okay, yep, yep, you guys did pretty good, good job on that. Uh, It's the busiest day of the year for restaurants. They're like slam packed, more than New Year's Day or even Valentine's Day is Mother's Day because either A, we don't want mom to have to cook or B, we don't want mom to have to eat our cooking. So one of the two, right, you know? Uh, Breakfast in bed, 40% of moms receive breakfast in bed. How many of you guys received breakfast in bed this morning? We are failing as a church. Okay, so what that means is in two services, hundreds of people, Melissa Larson is the only mom that received breakfast in bed in our church. Do not clap, you should be ashamed of yourselves. However, however, 30% 30% of breakfast in bed end up spilled in bed. So it's probably for the best, right? It's probably, it's probably for the best. Look, it is a day, a, day, a day of joy and celebration for so many different people. It, it means this day can mean all kinds of different things to different people. And for some, it is a day of joy and celebration. Um, for others, days like today are actually a day of pain. Um, some of you guys really miss mom today. Uh, Some of you, it's a reflection on a disconnect uh, with your mom. For some of you, um, it's a painful reminder that you thought you would be a mom, but you're not yet. And so here's my hope today as we look at the scriptures and look at this call that we have in our lives, um, that today would be acknowledged as an important day celebrating the call that God has put on our lives to invest in the next generation. And wherever we find ourselves, we can actually raise up the next generation. And so this is what I wanna talk about, the importance of us as a church and as individuals raising up the next generation. So let's look at Proverbs uh, 22.6. It's kind of this guiding principle for today's sermon. Uh, Train up a child in the way they should go, and even when they are older, they will not depart from it. Now, the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, and it's a book of wisdom. It is not laws, it is guiding principles. And what this is saying is that there is a way we can be intentional in our training, in our raising of children now that shape the future. And and what we need to start with is we actually need to raise with the future in mind. If we are gonna invest in the next generation, we need to start with the future in mind because listen to me, there's a day that will come and it is coming faster than any of us in this room who our parents realize where our kids will leave our house and enter adulthood. I, like, it's coming, you guys. I don't know what it's gonna look like for you. Maybe they're gonna go off to college Maybe they're gonna get their first apartment for the first time. Maybe some of them are gonna get married and that's the first time they're gonna leave your house. But every, for every parent in this room, that day is coming. And when that day comes, we're gonna have all kinds of questions. Did I, did I prepare her in the way that she needed to be prepared? What wisdom, what love, what lessons am I giving him to carry into this world? What brokenness is he bearing from growing up in this house? What is my legacy in relationship to them? And what's crazy is there's these milestones and markers along the way that are giving us, it's like God's grace giving us little signs and little glimpses. No, this day is coming. That day when your son doesn't hold your hand in public anymore, and you're like, oh, like, you, do, you don't want to experience this, and you don't want to be seen holding my hand anymore. Like, that's, that's a moment. That's a harder moment for parents than we realize. 
the moment when you start coming home and your kids don't run to the door excited to see you anymore because there's this level of uh, maturity and connection. It's not that they don't love you, but it's not the same. These, these are moments and pictures. Here's what's crazy is one day, um, you're gonna put, pick your kid up and put them down for the last time. Like one of these moments will be like the last time you ever pick your kid up. Like that, I read that a couple years ago. I was like, I don't care. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be doing squats till I'm 80. I'm just gonna see my kids and just pick them up. My, my daughter, um, whenever it's bedtime, I always take her down the stairs and, and we have this little routine where it's like, all right, the train's leaving. And sometimes she wants to be a little bit edgy and like wants me to go a little bit and she wants to jump on my back as I'm going down the stairs. And, you know, and then I grab her little feet and then her feet are like the little choo-choo train making it go and I put her in bed. And I did that on Friday night and then um, I went and got my son and it was a long day where, you know, at the pool and they were exhausted and tired and, and uh, I went to tell my son it's time to go to bed and he goes, Dad, can I ride the train tonight? Right? He's almost 10. And I was like, do you have a ticket? <laughs> He's like, I do. I didn't do the little leg thing. But I found in that moment, I was, like, I was like, what if this is the last time he ever asked me? Right? If I have the end in mind, if I have the future in mind, I embrace these moments in a different way. And what I want for you is to intentionally engage with your kids with that moment in mind. Every interaction, every conversation. And so you should have a goal. What is your goal in raising these kids? Here's the problem. So many of us are too busy, so occupied, that it's so overwhelmed by everything that we don't actually have a vision for what we're raising kids towards. It says train up a child in the way they should go. There should be a path. There should be a guidance. No, no, no. I know what I'm raising my kids to. And all of this is in mind. And there's going to be ups and downs and there's going to be disconnect, but it's all for a purpose that one day when they're older, they may, have, they may be a prodigal, they may have ups and downs, but that they would actually return to what I raised them towards. Because your kids, their future and your legacy, you guys, are just way too important for the destination to be an afterthought. And whether it's your children or maybe it's your grandchildren, or maybe it's kids that you've been called to invest in because they're a part of your church. They're not even your own kids. But these kids and their future is way too important. The future of this city matters. And you know what the future of the city is? It's in the, those little classrooms over there. And so we need to be intentional and purposeful. So I'm gonna, I wanna suggest a North Star, a goal. This is something I've been thinking about for a few years now, ever since I heard it, and it, I've just latched onto it. And it's given me a vision and it shapes how I make decisions in moments of frustration. It shapes what I say yes to in my life and career. And it shapes how I am present with my kids in any given moment. And here's my goal with my kids. I wanna raise kids who will choose to be connected to us, me and my wife, Jessie, connected to us and Jesus, even when they no longer have to be. Amen. That's my goal. Because right now they have to be, you know what I'm saying? But the day is gonna come where the choice is gonna be on them. And I wanna have such depth of relationship that they choose to be with us. They actually wanna stay connected. They wanna go on trips and vacation. And this, this, I have every, this approach is in mind with everything I do. Of course, I want them to be kids of character, without a doubt. I want my kids to work hard and succeed. I want them to follow God's calling on their life. But ultimately, this is a relational goal that I want them to experience such healthy, loving, solid relationships with their parents, me and Jesse, now, that even when they no longer have to spend time with me and their mom, they'll actually want to. This will be a desire of theirs. It was funny, I, I was telling this to my son, Dax, we were driving the other day, and I was like, hey, Dax, you know my goal for you? And, and I just shared this. And uh, I was like, what do you think about that? And he laughed. He's like, Dad, of course I'll spend time with you. I'm like, oh yeah, you say that now. Okay, but can you just sign this document that says that now? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but, but it, it's, it's, it's a goal in mind. But also, I want their experiences with Jesus and the church to be encouraging and authentic, not burdensome and hypocritical. So much so that they will love him and his bride when they no longer are in my house. And so this is why days like today are so important. Um, and one of the things that we're gonna do towards the end of this service is we're gonna have a child dedication moment. 
And what those parents are declaring in that moment is, I'm raising these kids to love Jesus and his church. I am pointing them to biblical values. I'm not gonna be perfect, I'm not gonna have it all right, but I'm making a public declaration that I'm raising these kids with the future in mind. And here's, here's something I wanna say right now. I'll bring it up again at the end, but um, there's a number of you who signed up to do this, but there's a number of you who did not sign up to do this, and I'm gonna invite you at the end. Man, go get your kids. Like, after hearing this heart and vision, for raising kids that love Jesus and love his church and, and you have healthy relationships, maybe today is a day where you actually go get your kids and you bring them forward and you stand in front of your church and say, I'm making a public declaration to raise these kids in this way. I, I share that because I want you to be thinking about it now. And one of the things we ask parents to do in the dedication, all those who have already signed up, they, they think about three words, three words that they're raising their kids towards. And I remember with our daughter, Nova, when we got up front in front of this church and dedicated her, um, one of the words we picked for her was the word determined. And sometimes I feel like that was a mistake. Whoa, bless you, yes, okay. Sometimes I feel like that was a mistake because like, holy smokes, that girl is determined, right? You know, it's like, I wanted, for, I wanted to have that in the world, but sometimes as parents, I'm like, this girl is so stubborn. I mean, determined, you know what I'm saying? Like, so when, um, my wife and I, we were gonna take our kids to Maui. And it was year 2020 or 2021. And as a lot of you guys maybe remember, there was this thing called COVID. Um, or maybe you blocked it out because of trauma. But when, we were, when you would wanna go on a trip, you would have to get a, a negative test before you went. And so we booked our trip and we had our flights and we had the place we were staying, all of it paid for, all of it ready to go. The last thing we needed was to get this test the day before we left. And so we found the one place that was scheduling it for a 24-hour turnaround, and it was over in Beaverton, and we get the kids in the car, and we drive, it was like a drive-up window where there was kind of like a nurse um, o -o over off to the side, and she would hand you, um, the, you know, these test-taking instruments, and you'd have this swab that you'd, you know, stick up your nose, tickle your brain, and, uh, you know, pa pass back. And so her, uh, um, my wife and I, we did it, and, you know, of course, your eyes are, like, watering because you're doing it, and then you're, like, telling your kids, it's going to be fine. No, you know. <laughs> well, Nova witnessed that, and she decided then and there, determined, there is no way on God's green earth that she's taken that test. And so we had a decision in that moment. Um, we could cancel our trip and lose all our money and lose all the fun and moments and memories, or we could get that girl to take that test. <laughs> and so we're like, we're gonna get this girl to take this test. But she fought us like a literal wild banshee. <laughs> it took Jesse and I's all, like we were tag teaming, like one on each arm strength, you know, one person, she's kicking, screaming. It was like that scene in Jurassic Park <laughs> where the Dilophosaurus attacks, you know, the mailman from Seinfeld, you know what I'm talking about? They're screaming, and it was like, it was like that. It was like, uh, like, what is happening? You know, the nurse is like traumatized watching this, but we're like, we're going on this trip, right? Okay. So we get done, we get the swab, we pass it over, you know, and, you know, you know Nova's hysterical, Jesse's hysterical, I'm hysterical, D Dax is laughing, you know, we, okay. <laughs> and so we drive around the corner, and we get out of there, and I pull the car over, and I turn around, and I say, Nova, Here's what I need you to hear. I am so proud of you right now. If anyone ever tries to make you do something you don't wanna do, you fight like hell. And I love you, and I love that you are determined. Now, do you want to get ice cream? <laughs> and she asked what she always asked, can I get sprinkles, right? <laughs> yes, you can get sprinkles, of course, right? But here's the thing. If if, my, if we have the end in mind, we can view these moments differently. It's not a moment where I'm like, I can't believe you made that embarrassing and difficult for me. I'm like, no, like, I want a girl who is strong and brave and courageous and determined. And moments like that are moments that, that shape them. See, we have to look with the future in mind. And, and, and if we have the future in mind, there's a few things that are gonna shape now. Um, here's one of them. Um, I will not allow burdens and busyness to keep me from being present with my kids. I saw these two graphs in the last couple weeks that just completely shaped how I think about time with my kids. Uh, the first tracks your age as a parent and your time per day with your kids. So 300 minutes, that's five hours. So, um, you know, some parents very, you know, have kids very young, but the majority of your time 
is in your early, late 20s, early 30s, early 40s, and then it starts to really just dive off a cliff. And I was like, man, there's this window. And then I read this other stat that just rocked me. 75% of the time you get with their kids in their lifetime is before age 12. Once your kid reaches age 12, after that, you only have a quarter of your moments, minutes, memories with them. Now, that makes me want to think about how present I am in these times and these moments that I get, does it not? And here's what I want you to hear. You guys, parents, listen to me. 20 years from now, the only people who will remember all those times you stayed late at work are gonna be your kids. Your boss is not gonna remember. They're no longer gonna be impressed with you. You're not gonna remember what you were doing and why it was so important. Your coworkers are no longer gonna be like, oh, they're really moving up the ladder. That's wonderful. But your kids will remember that you were not at their game. Your kids will remember that you were not at the dinner table. And if this is our window, then let's make the most of it. Let's build the relationships now while we have the time, investing in the eternal. I I face this all the time as a pastor. There's always more meetings that I could have, more sit downs, more conversations. And it's been hard for me, but I have to say no to so many things. Because here's what I've learned. You guys, in this church, I am replaceable and and replicable all day long but I am indispensable in my kids' lives. And so we have to view through this lens. No, if we are raising with the future in mind, this is the moment we have. Second, um, I will not destroy our bond over disobedience. I'm gonna talk about discipline in a second here and the importance and the value of it. But, But I will not talk to my kids in a way that I wouldn't talk to anyone else. You know what I'm saying? For some of us, we have this harshness in our tone, this demeaning in our words, this overbearing of our burdens, and they're shaping an identity in our kids that they're gonna spend the rest of their lives recovering from. But if I have the end in mind, and my long-term goal is a healthy relationship with my kids, then I'm gonna work through disobedience in a different way. Yeah, absolutely, there's discipline. Again, I'll talk to that in a second. But... But I don't take these moments as an affront to my identity. How dare you ever? Like, no, no. I love my kids and I'm building relationships. And discipline is not about guarding my defensiveness. Discipline is about training up a child in the way they should go because I care about the long-term relationship. Third, I'm not gonna be a hypocritical Jesus follower. I'm not. You don't, here's the thing, you don't see me when I'm not on the stage. You don't see me when I'm not telling stories that I get to shape any way that I want. Um, You know who does see me? My kids. And they're gonna know whether my faith is authentic by how I live at home. And, And here's what leads to kids disconnecting from the church and from Jesus later on. It's not too much time here running in the hallways. It's not songs that are outdated and, oh, they didn't update those enough. It's not lessons that weren't theologically deep and rich enough. You know what it is? It's parents whose home life and church life doesn't align. It's kids step back and be like, they don't actually believe that. But if you do actually believe, I'm not saying, none of us are perfect, none of us will be perfect, but if you're like, man, who my parents are in front of other people and how they talk about Jesus in front of other people aligns with how they talk about him at home and how they treat me, then that is gonna just deepen their faith in their relationship with Jesus. Fourth, I will not abdicate my position as their parent. And it can be easy to say, okay, my goal long-term is to have a good relationship with my kids, so I'm just gonna start now. We're just gonna be bros. That's gonna be my sis. Like, no, no, no. You're, you know what your kids, you know what children need? They need a parent, not a peer. And so they need you invested in that way. And it, I know as a parent, it feels so tempting to either fall into the friendship, oh, we're just friends, or boss, where you just, you are not their friend, and you are not their boss, you're their parent. You are their father or their mother, and that's what they need. They need your love, they need your guidance in a way that only you can provide. And so you cannot abdicate that. I, I heard it once said, and this, just, this rattled me, if you raise your kids, you can spoil your grandkids but if you spoil your kids, you'll raise your grandkids. And we have to make intentional investments now to come alongside in that way. So what do we need? We need a roadmap for each season. 
We need, a, we need a guiding principle for these areas. And I got this from a book, and I just found it so helpful. And I'm going to give an overview, and then I'm going to kind of break it down, okay? The categories are different years. It's the discipline years, 0 to 5, the training years, 5 to 12, the coaching years, 12 to 18, and the friendship years, 18 and beyond. Now, these four stages, they give us a framework for moving intentionally through our relationship with our kids as they grow up and they move on from one stage to the next. And here's what I need you to understand. Kids move from one stage to the next without thought or effort. It just comes naturally to them. But parents don't. And so often we can get ourselves stuck in previous stages when our kids have moved on. And we've seen this. You've all seen that dad at soccer practice that is still yelling at and disciplining his kids like they, like, like, like they were little. And they're not two, they're 12. They, what they need is they need coaching. They need partnership and investment. And he is just, you know, just on them for every little thing. Or the mom who, whose kids are grown and out of the house. And every time they call to check in and she views it as her opportunity to be their personal coach and tell them what they're doing wrong and what they need to do differently. Here's the thing. Um, those kids eventually stop calling home for advice. They stop opening up in a different way. Teenagers who every time they come to you are just berated with discipline, um, they eventually stop telling you what's happening in their lives. So we have to intentionally and purposely move through these stages and allow this to be a roadmap. So let's, let's look at these a little bit closer. Um, the discipline years. Zero to five. Here's the po point of this, is for your kids to see that there are consequences, both good and bad, for their actions. You're training them. You're strengthening the obedience muscle through multiple reps and appropriate consequences. Proverbs 13 puts it like this. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline. It's like, man, if you love your kids, you will actually discipline. And the primary focus of that is those first five years. Man, I need to teach them to obey. Because like, you don't have to teach them to disobey, do you, right? That is just like naturally inherent in all of us. Sometimes you question like, w what was wrong with your genetic code, by the way, how disobedient your kids are. But you have to actually focus. And let me just say a couple things about this. First, you guys, dis discipline is hard. So don't skip it, skip out of it because of laziness. You've, we've all seen that kid who's just like running around wild and the mom shows up and he's like, oh, this just little Johnny expressing himself, you know? You're like, no, little Johnny is ex gonna express himself to a life of crime and thievery. <laughs> like, you need to actually discipline. Or and rather than discipline, we distract. We just like, no, I, we, we go to the restaurant and rather than teaching them how to obey, we just put a screen in front of them. No, we, we, we need to, we're teaching these kids Second, discipline out of love, not anger, okay? You absolutely need to come up with age-appropriate consequences, and different things are gonna work for different parents depending on your circumstance, and they're gonna work for different kids, okay? So this is not, this is how you discipline a child. No, it has to be there. But I need you to discipline out of love, not anger. So maybe some of you guys discipline with timeouts or with spankings or with removing a toy or a reward. But let me just say this, and I think this is important to hear. Like, your kids shouldn't fear you. They need to be safe. Don't hit your kids, man. Like, I, and don't, don't discipline in those moments where you're just, like, you feel all that anger. Like, I know it. The kids can push you to that, that moment, but do not discipline out of anger. Discipline out of love. I've heard people quote this verse here that I just read and completely misuse it. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You know what a rod is? You know what a rod is for a shepherd? It's not so that he can beat his sheep, it's so that he can guide them. It's so that he can protect them. And so this, is, this verse is speaking to discipline, but it's not a, it's not a pr biblical promotion for hurting a child. It's, it's a call that we have a burden and a responsibility to be loving guides to, to the children we've been entrusted with. Third, either you teach your kids consequences or life will. Your kids will get disciplined. And hopefully it's by you when they're young and, and they can learn that guiding principle. But if you don't, then it's gonna happen later in life. It's gonna be a teacher 
or it's gonna be a principal, or it's gonna be a boss, or it's gonna be a police officer, and the stakes are way higher. The most loving thing you can do for your little kids is put in the time and effort to say, no, I, I, I actually need to lovingly teach them obedience and teach them consequences. And, and you move through that phase and it does, it does get easier. And you make a shift and because discipline is all about correction and you make the shift because training is about development. And those years five through 12, the training years, oh man, they are so fun because kids actually want to learn. They wanna know what you know. They wanna be taught. Man, how do, I, how do I fix the car, right? How do I make breakfast? How do I do all these different things? The training years are all about helping kids gain the skills, values, and character that they need to succeed in life. Psalm 127 says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Listen, our job as parents, as investors raising up the next generation is not to coddle children, it's to sharpen arrows. You are preparing them for a life of meaning, to live their calling, to be influences, to be missionaries, to make a difference in our community, and so sharpen them. And so this isn't about just telling them what is important. It's about showing them and inviting them into the process. You're not just telling them how to re be respectful of others. You're training them and practicing with them. So you guys, train skills and values. This has to be a thing. If you do not impart your values on your children, the culture will impart its values on your children in its place. And so you have to impart values. Uh, one author put it like this in a book I was reading on parenting. He said, may, talking about raising sons, he says, may his richest experiences be ones you curated and planned, not just random traumatic events that lead to brokenness. And man, I wanna be intentional in this. This is why like kids sports is so important at this stage, right? It's, it's valuable that they're a part of these things in these different ways, okay? Um, and parents get this wrong. You th parents think our kids are in sports so they can get a D1 scholarship, you know, right? And so we obsess and we berate and we practice. No, you're training them how to work hard, how to be respectful of opponents, how to get up when they fail, how to sacrifice for the sake of a team. It's a training stage. And so that's why you want to, them to experience these things. Failure is good, okay? Failure on the soccer field is way less harsh than failure in real life, okay? Let them experience failure, okay? You don't have to have a trophy and a juice box for after every practice, right? They can experience failure. It's a good thing because you're training them. This is why you sit and read with your kids. You're training them to flex their creativity muscles for adventure and learning. This is why you teach your kids to make breakfast, right? I was having a conversation with my son. I was like, hey, what are some of the things that mom has trained you to do? She's always been really good. He's like, she trained me how to make breakfast. And mom was sitting there and she goes, then how come you never make it? He's like, well, I can, but it's just so nice when you do. Right? You know what I'm <laughs> You're training their kids. They won't have a 24-7 butler the rest of their life. They can call mom. This is not Downton Abbey, right? Okay? They, they have to experience, you're like, training them in these things, okay? So train skills and values, but also help your kids develop character, not coping mechanisms. Get, this, get your kids away from the screen. Choose an intentional allotted time, but stop letting Netflix and YouTube parent your kids. Actually be intentional in these moments. I'll have my kids come up to me and they're like, oh, dad, I'm bored, right? Can we all watch a show? And I'm sitting there with a you know, total dad at acronym. I'm just saying, you know, saying dumb things like only, only boring people get bored. But I realize I'm sitting there on my phone scrolling. What am I teaching them? I'm teaching them this is the coping mechanism right now. And my wife, my wife and I have learned this thing, we've realized this thing, that if we go outside, the outside is this thing outside of your house, okay? <laughs> if we go outside, they will too. Our kids and our cats follow for some reason, you know? And they find something to occupy themselves. And so training is not telling, training is showing and participating, coming along. So help them develop character, not 
coping mechanisms because they want to learn at this phase. But then you move into the coaching years. And this is vital because they're now a teenager. They're a young adult. I want you to look at how Paul writes to Timothy, this young pastor he's coaching. This is not an old man that he's coaching. This is a young man. He says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but rather set an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. So this is a stage where you come along and you, you should coach. You should say, hey, you are becoming an adult and I am on your side. I want to speak into this. I want to give you guidance. But your goal is no longer I'm disciplining you at every little thing you do wrong or I'm training you, you know, like you're a little kid. No, I'm coaching you. You can do this. I believe in you. I can invest in you. This is what Paul does with Timothy and it's beautiful. Your goal at this stage is to be safe, wise counsel for your teenagers, that they know they can turn to you in anything. And so keep them coming to you for guidance and support. So how do we break this down? Just two things that I think are helpful. One, let your teens come to you with anything. Let them talk to you about absolute, anything's on the table. Cultivate constant conversations. And when they come to you and they share something hard or a mistake, they don't get discipline, they get coaching. You see that? There's a, there's a big difference, okay? And so no conversation should ever be off limits with your kids. You, they can talk about sex, they can talk about money, they can talk about faith, they can talk about fears, they can talk about questions. They know you are a safe person to talk to because you don't just, you, you do, you don't just jump on every little thing that they do or say wrong. Again, from another book, it said, may it never be said that your son thinks there is more wisdom about life from Google and YouTube than from you. No, be someone that, no, you can talk to me about this and we can work our way through it. But the other side of this, not only is no conversation off limits, but no situation is too dire. And what I mean by this, make a rule, and they know this as they're entering those teen years, that they can call you, text you, reach out to you in any situation, and you will be the one that comes and gets them. No questions asked. If they wanna talk, fine. But listen, I know it's very, there's very possible that there could be a day where my teenage son or my teenage daughter sends me a text and says, Dad, I'm in a bad situation, I need you to come get me and they're gonna get in the car, and they may be smelling like alcohol and regret, but they will not be grounded, they will not be scolded, they will not be punished, they will be home safe. And they will know they can reach out to me in those moments. And I love them, and I want good things for them, but they know their dad is a safe person, their mom is a safe person they can reach out to, and we are their biggest support in those moments. Here's the second thing. Not only be, be able to talk about anything, but develop common interests with them. I was having a conversation with my brother a few years ago, and we were talking about our upbringing, and I just made a comment to him. I was like, dude, I feel like we, I feel like we grew up in different households, because the way you talk about my dad and the way I talk about my dad, my experience was so different. I'm like, dad was at every single basketball game of mine. I was like, we, we rode dirt bikes together. We did all these sh- things, all, all my upbringing, we shared all these things. And he looked at me, and he says, that's because your interests aligned with dad's, so it was an easy connection. But the things I was interested in, he wasn't interested in. And I was like, Brandon, you were right. <laughs> that is so true. And so I've thought about that as I, as I raise my kids. It's not about my kids gaining and developing my interests. It's about, I wanna learn what my kids are interested in and come around them in those things. So like, I love, I love basketball. And when, I, when Jesse and I, when our firstborn was a boy, I was like, yes, I'm gonna have a little athlete. It's gonna be amazing. He's gonna love basketball or soccer, you know, or you know, something fun, not boring like baseball, but something fun, you know? <laughs> Some of you guys that are like that, just get up and leave. And he hates sports. He's not very coordinated, he's not very good at it. He's just, he's never been interested in it in his life. Um, and like, that was like this hard thing for me. You know what my kid loves? Creatures, animals, bugs, snakes, birds, fish. I, I'm like, are you kidding me, God? Like, I wanted Steph Curry and I got Steve Irwin. You know, like, <laughs> it's this miss, what's happening? But here's the thing. I believe that I'm called to develop common interests with my kids. And I'm not trying to um, supplant my shortcomings as a professional athlete through my children. 
I'm trying to have experiences that we can share together. Okay, so now I'm into saltwater aquariums. Deal with it, right? Because it's a way I can bond with my kid. And, and, and I'll, I'll, we need to bond with our children, find these common interests. And so figure out what, light your kids, what lights your kid up and then learn it and encourage it and invest time and money in it. You will be glad that you did. And who knows how it's gonna shape their future. John Tyson put it like this in his, his book, The Intentional Father. He says, when a father, and again, this is geared towards fathers, but this is parenting, this is investment. When a father is present, emotionally healthy, and involved in his child's life, the child has a tremendous advantage in the world to navigate its complexities and challenges with joy and confidence. Would you have that kind of bond with your kids? With the goal being you could enter the friendship years. All of that laying a groundwork where you're like, man, I actually have a friendship and a connection with my kids where I can spend time with them. A few years ago, we, my wife and I, we were on the beach, went to Cannon Beach for Father's Day. And we got a text from another friend, Chris, Chris and Stacy. Uh, they text us, they're like, hey, we're at our parents' house, uh, not too far from you guys. You, when you leave, you should come stop by. And so as we were leaving Cannon Beach on our way home, we went and stopped by their house and just spent, we thought we were gonna pop in and say hi. And we spent at least, you know, I mean, we spent like an hour and a half, two hours just sitting and hanging out and talking with their whole family. And I'll never forget, it was really dark. We got in the car and Jesse and I just had this conversation on the way home. Like, that's the kind of parents we wanna be. We wanna have a relationship with our grown adult kids where they enjoy spending time with us. There's, there's an investment there, there's this goal. That's, that's what we're raising our kids toward, that we can enter these friendship years and actually have relationships. Because we can move into this goal. Now, here's what I wanna say and here's what I wanna end with. Um, I want to call you to invest outside of your circumstances. Because, listen, I know all of this sounds like this. It's geared towards, okay, if I'm a parent, this applies to me. But this is the call of the church, that all of us would invest outside of our circumstances. Some of you, um, you have kids grown and raised. So one of my biggest joys that I've seen is some of the parents and grandparents who have started coming to this church because their adult kids are coming to this church and they're saying, time with you matters. I want that relationship, and I am so grateful for that. Some of you are in a place in life where you thought by now you would have kids and for some reason, either a choice or circumstance or pain, you don't. Here's my call. There is, there is a kid who needs your investment in their life for you to pour into them. Look at how Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica. He says, as apostles of Christ, we certainly had the right to make some demands of you, but instead, we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only the gospel, but our own lives too. This is Paul, an apostle. He's saying we didn't have demands. Paul was single, unmarried, no children, yet his whole life was dedicated to raising up the next generation, to investing outside of his circumstances. And this is my call for you. Church, would we be a church that invests in the next generation rather than sitting back and saying, life has not gone as planned. It hasn't gone as planned for any of us. But in the situation we find ourselves, I, wouldn't, I need you to hear this. I don't know your circumstances, but I know your calling. And a part of your calling is to invest in the next generation. And there is a kid out there who could use your intentional investment. I have these really good friends. Um, they started coming to Rise a number of years ago after a really painful season. Uh, the husband had just lost his mom. This super engaged grandma with their kids. They have four kids, and now they lose grandma. And I remember having a conversation with the wife one time. I was like, hey, well, what's your relationship with your mom? Where does she live? Is she far away? I've never met her, seen her. And she just said, oh, um, she started crying. And she said, that's the most painful relationship in my life because my mom actually lives in this community, but we haven't spoken for years. She's not, she's not a part of my kid's life. It's a broken relationship. So they have these four kids that they're raising without family support and without grandparents investing in their lives. 
And, but they're doing amazing in it. They're engaged in it, and they're part of our church. But every once in a while, moments come up that just, you know, are kind of a turn of the knife. And one of those was a couple months ago for a little five-year-old Briar. He was at school. And uh, on the calendar, it said Grandparents' Day. And so his mom, knowing that day's coming up, sat him down and said, hey, they're doing a thing called Grandparents' Day. And because you don't have grandparents, um, I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna be there for you that day. And it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be okay. And he was kind of like, okay. Well, the next day when he went to school, his teacher explained a, a little more detail what Grandparents' Day was. She got up and said, um, this is not a day for mommies and daddies. Mommies and daddies won't be here. Your grandparents are gonna be here. And, and Briar, recognizing in that moment the pain and grief of not having grandparents, he began to cry and break down. And he got home and mom consoled him and tried to work through it and all the different pieces. Well, when Grandparents' Day rolled around, there was a couple from our church who has basically adopted this family and invested in these kids so much that they call them Poppy and Jojo. And for Grandparents' Day, Poppy and Jojo took the day off work, drove from Washington down to Happy Valley and went and sat with Briar as his grandparents and they sent this picture. And Briar was just beaming with pride because he's like, I have grandparents with me. You guys, this is a picture of the church. The call James says the only religion worthwhile is one that cares for widows and orphans. We're all hurting. We all have grief. We all have moments. And so days like today are days we're celebrating and honoring those that we can honor. But days like today are also days worth pressing deeper into the gospel and saying we are called to be a beacon of hope and light and invest. And so invest. I don't know if it's in those kids in that classroom. I don't know if it's a neighborhood. I don't know if it's a, it's a grandchild, but invest in your kids. It's not a promise that if you train them up in the way they should go, they'll never depart from them. That's not a promise. It's a proverb. But if we live with intentionality now, there's so much wisdom in them coming back tied to the way that they should go. And even if they don't, May we be parents that love them through thick and thin of the whole process. That's the call of the church. So here, here's what I want to invite. I'm going to close in prayer in a second here. And those of you guys who are dedicating kids, I want you to go back and grab your kids. And then you're going to, we're going to do one song, and then Chris is going to come forward and lead us in the dedication. But there are some of you here today who did not sign up for dedication but are like, I need to make a public declaration for how I'm raising my kids. We had five families join spontaneously in the first service. And I just wanna invite you, go back and get your kids. Like, I don't, care, I don't care if they're not a baby anymore. Like, maybe if little Timmy's 25, that, you might have missed the, the window, okay? <laughs> but like, go get them and bring them forward. And you can explain to them later, hey, I, this is the declaration I made today. I want you to love Jesus, and I'm gonna raise you in the church, and I'm gonna teach you biblical values. And I wanted to make a public declaration of that in front of my church. And we just wanna pray with you and recognize this, the sacredness of the moment and come and support you. So I'm gonna pray here in a second. And as I do, go grab your kids. Lord, we want to be a church that raises the next generation. We believe the future of this city is in those classrooms. And we want them to love you more than anything. And this is a sacred call that you've called us to. Would we be so intentional in our investment in these kids' lives and raising them up and calling them to goodness and grace and love and power? And so we, we cherish, we thank you for the blessing of children. We, we thank you that this is a church whose quiver is full. May we follow your call, guided by your spirit, rooted in your word, to sharpen these arrows for your glory. I pray all this in your name. Amen.